Uh, greetings fellow nerds, it's time for the January 2016 question and answer video. First one for the new year. Once again we have some new big sponsors. They are JC founder of GhostSpeak, Wesley Gardner, and LVE. Thank you very much for your contributions. Now JC founder of GhostSpeak made a $100 per video contribution, so I asked what kind of video they wanted me to produce. They said they wanted me to use and review their browser extension. I guess using the Patreon feed to pay for advertising is acceptable. Okay, so let me review it now. I've already installed the extension and I've clued a link in the video description. Let me log into my Google account here. As you know, nerd rage test, two factor authentic. Okay, the company promotes the GhostSpeak extension as a socialized Google search extension. If you enter a query into Google search, in this case Donald Trump, the extension inserts a message board onto the search page. Here you can enter whatever you like for other GhostSpeak users making that search query to see. So here on Donald Trump's search page I can comment that I don't like his climate science. Think of this as a version of YouTube comments but for Google search terms. Okay, let me, uh, let me type in my channel. And there's no one commenting on it. I suppose that makes sense since this browser extension is relatively unknown. I might as well write something in for myself. And that is basically the GhostSpeak extension. I've included links in the video description if you want to try it out. Similar to YouTube comments, I can see this facilitating some intelligent conversation and a great deal more not so intelligent conversation. But hey, that's half the fun of the internet. Okay, so moving on. I have another corporate sponsor I want to talk about, PopChest. I'm actually working with them to release a video or two on their video sharing platform. Don't worry, I'm not abandoning YouTube. I just want to experiment a bit. PopChest lets you pay for videos similar to Patreon, YouTube fan funding, or YouTube Red. Now an annoying thing about the existing systems is that a significant portion of the donations are chewed up in processing fees by PayPal, the bank transfers, the credit card companies, and on the video platform itself. I want to try PopChest because they get around that by using Bitcoin. Now there are some fees with converting Bitcoin, but overall I think it would be cheaper. Of course the only way to truly find out is to try it. An advantage for you, my viewers, is that you are in total control of your bitcoins and can decide exactly where they go and how much. I know some of you prefer that higher level of control rather than let Patreon pull money out of your PayPal account, which in turn pulls money out of your credit card or bank. So for those of you that want to donate but don't like or maybe even just can't use PayPal with Patreon, you can help out using bitcoin instead on your own terms. Anyway, I'm still working out the details with PopChest and hope to get back to you guys soon. I'll probably release a video on their site in February or something. But in the meantime, if you don't already have Bitcoin or don't even know what it is, I've included a link in the video description to Coinbase where you can learn about Bitcoins and even buy them. Although you don't need to buy Bitcoins from Coinbase specifically. You can use other wallets and exchanges if you want. But it's still a great site to learn about Bitcoins. Okay, let's get to the questions. Now questions are submitted on my Patreon feed. Those individuals that donate $10 get their questions answered to the best of my ability guaranteed, and I usually answer the questions of those who donate lesser amounts although I may drop some to save time. Anyway, first question. Martel Devignode asks, I've been reading about ethane thiol a bit because of a recent gas leak near where I live. I'm wondering, is sulfur the main reason why we smell many thiols very strongly? Okay, uh, yes, thiols and a lot of organic sulfur compounds like sulfides and disulfides have very strong repulsive smells to them. We've evolved to be very sensitive to them because you usually encounter such compounds in nature from decaying organic matter. Dead things are a source of harmful pathogens as well as poisons and shouldn't be eaten or handled, so evolving a repulsive response to them was beneficial to our ancestors. Processed natural gas actually doesn't have a smell. And in the past there were some tragic accidents with many lives lost when a gas leak went undetected for too long and eventually found an ignition source and exploded. So companies inject tiny amounts of thiols or organic sulfides into natural gas to give them a smell. Sulfur compounds are selected since the great majority of people can smell them, and due to our evolution, we can detect them in extremely small quantities, so you don't need much to get desired effect. Okay, next question. Keith asks, 
Dental amalgam and stainless steel cookware contain mercury and nickel respectively. What are the chemical mechanisms for making alloys safer than pure forms? For the case of mercury, it's just the alloy itself that makes it safer. In dental amalgam, the mercury bonds with silver, tin, and copper, and because the mercury is bonded with them, it now requires much more energy to vaporize into mercury vapor. So there is very little toxic mercury vapor to worry about. Another property of the amalgam is that it's very corrosion resistant, so in the environment of a person's mouth, it doesn't rust and release ions. The oxidation potential required to do that is higher than what a person's mouth can provide. Overall, the amount of mercury released is very little, although it is there and it can be detected. That being said, there is movement toward avoiding mercury in dental fillings since mercury is still an environmental hazard and some people, particularly younger individuals, may be more sensitive to mercury than others. As for nickel and stainless steel, the protection mechanism is a bit different. Stainless steel has a significant quantity of chromium in the alloy, usually between 10 and 26%. Now, the iron in the steel corrodes and so does the chromium, but when chromium corrodes, it forms a thin but very tough layer of chromium oxide. This is very different from the weak and porous iron oxide that forms on iron. The chromium oxide blocks further attack to the metal. Even if it gets scratched, the layer reforms from the chromium underneath. If the stainless steel can't corrode and come apart, the nickel inside of it can't either. Now, tiny detectable amounts of metals do leach out of stainless steel cookware, but the amount is considered insignificant to human health. Okay, next question. Jason Black asks, you know that thing where lithium reacts with anhydrous liquid ammonia to generate those really pretty solvated electrons? Is it possible to drain those electrons off as a power source? Uh, technically yes, you can drain them off if you simultaneously insert negative ions to compensate for the charge loss, but any energy you would get from them would not be any greater than what you would get from a normal lithium battery. The electrical potential energy in those electrons originally came from the lithium metal. Lithium batteries already efficiently extract electrical energy from lithium metal or lithium compounds. That being said, chemists do use solvate electrons for reactions like the birch reduction. It's very convenient in some cases to have a high energy reductant in liquid form. So in a way, we are using it as an energy source to power our reduction reactions. We just use it as is and don't bother draining off the electrons. Okay, next question. Pablo Soros asks, why did you end up working with inorganic chemistry? What is something about organic chemistry that you don't like working with? Can you explain why does this divide exist among chemists? You know, that is a good question. Unfortunately, I have a very stupid answer. <laughs> I went into inorganic chemistry because when I was picking supervisors for my PhD, all the organic chemistry professors at my university weren't taking any more students. So I just went with the inorganic professor. I'm sorry, that's the truth. There is actually nothing wrong with organic chemistry. And keep in mind that all chemists know a little bit about every other chemistry, even if we don't specialize in it. There is no divide really in chemistry, but a specialized chemist will usually solve a problem in their field a lot faster, more efficiently, and a lot cheaper than a chemist for which that problem is outside their field. So I could probably go work in an organic chemistry lab. Just the time it would take for me to do the same task would not be as cost effective as a chemist with an actual organic chemistry PhD. Personally, I find all chemistry to be a very rewarding and interesting experience. Hey, Matthew Sachs asks, Can you describe how to make elemental sodium? Uh, sure, I know of three ways. The first is to mix together some hydroxide and magnesium metal and ignite them. This process is almost like a thermite process and transfers oxygen from the sodium hydroxide to the magnesium metal to make magnesium oxide, hydrogen gas, and sodium metal. The problem with this method is that a lot of the sodium is embedded in the resulting mass of magnesium oxide ash. Nighthawking Light has a good video on this process and I'll link it in the video description. The second way is Kastner cell electrolysis where you melt sodium hydroxide and electrolyze it. The anode generates oxygen while the cathode generates sodium and hydrogen. The difficulty of this method is that the temperature must be kept very close to the melting point of sodium hydroxide, but not over too much or else the sodium produced it would dissolve into the sodium hydroxide and form a metalloid. This metalloid is conductive and shorts out the cell, stopping further sodium formation. This method is also very dangerous as molten sodium hydroxide liquefies human flesh quite rapidly, and the molten metal has a tendency to pop and bubble as you electrolyze it. You also can't use glass containers since the molten sodium hydroxide eats through glass as well. The third way is the classic down cell process. 
you melt a low melting eutectic of sodium and calcium chloride and electrolyze that. Sodium comes off the cathode and chlorine off the anode. Because you're melting a salt rather than a caustic alkali, it's a little bit easier on the container materials and you don't need as fine temperature control. The downside is that you require even higher temperatures with their associated dangers. Okay, so that's all the questions for this month. If you want to ask a question, please submit to my Patreon feed. Anyone who donates more than $10 will get their questions answered guaranteed. Less than that, and I probably will answer your question if I have the time. Thanks for watching my video and take care.